Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for allowing us to come into your space of worship on tonight. We pray that you will click the share button and start a watch party with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight will come from 1 John 5, 19 through 21. 1 John 5, 19 through 21. And it reads, We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under control of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God and he is eternal life. In verse number 21 says, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. You know, God is a loving God. He is a merciful God, and he loves us so much. When we do wrong, and we will, God is standing right there, pleading with us to repent and come back to him. And if you are not saved, call on the name of the Lord. He longs to save you, to walk with you, and to carry you through this life of uncertainty. No one else in this world would send their son, their only son, to die for a world that's evil and wicked. But God loved us so much. We didn't love God first. God loved us first. Pastor Davis is always asking me, so why do you love me? And my response to him is, because you loved me first. So we are just so thankful that God loved us first. And I'm so glad he did. Because God loved us and did so much for us, we can't help but love God back. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. To me, he's so wonderful. Just to know that he is mine. Oh, how I love Jesus. There is. Jesus, 
God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus of Christ we come. We thank you for another privilege, another chance, another opportunity to come before you. We thank you, God, for blessing us and keeping us all night and all day long. We thank you for the movement of your hand. Now, Lord, we come asking you to forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for messing up. Forgive us for not doing the things that are pleasing in your sight. Lord, we pray, Father God, that you minister to us through your word on tonight. That your word will become real to us. That your word will minister to us in such a way that we can run and tell other men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of Jesus the Christ. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us. Saturate us with your word. Speak to us through your word. Bless us through your word. And keep our hearts through your word. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus the Christ. We pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. for who he is and we thank God for Jesus and we ought to love him Amen. for he has loved us first. Amen. Thank the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight for our Bible study. Thank you for joining us one more time on a Wednesday night for church. Thank you for our midweek service, our Bible study. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. To our visitors, thank you for being a part of our service. And we thank all our members for tuning in online and, and making sure that we continue to hear from the Lord Jesus the Christ. We're in Colossians chapter 2 again tonight. Colossians chapter 2, the verses for tonight are verses 16 and 17. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 is where we are tonight. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. We left off last time talking about, about verse number 15, where, where the Bible is clear that Jesus Christ have made a public spectacle of those who wish to keep the Christians bound. Jesus Christ having disarmed the principalities, disarmed the powers, and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. We need to understand that Jesus Christ has given us the victory. The problem is many times we don't walk in victory. We are Christians. We are Christians. We are of Christ. We have the victory. And because we have the victory, we ought to walk in victory. We ought to act like we have victory. We ought to carry ourselves like we have the victory. The problem is too many of us have low self-esteem but Jesus has given us victory. 
there is no reason for any one of us to have low self-esteem who don't believe in themselves nor believe in the God that you serve because over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ gave you the victory on a skull hill called Calvary. The Bible says, when you look at these verses, a little further up, verse number 14 says that Jesus has, has nailed the old way to the cross. He has taken the old way, the way before Jesus Christ. He has nailed it to the cross. Jesus Christ lived out the entire law, but when he came to Calvary, he nailed the old way to the cross. He nailed it to the cross. Not only did he nail the old way to the cross, the Old Testament way to the cross, he also nailed our sins to the cross. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 8, there is now no condemnation to those who walk in the spirit, those who walk after Christ, those who live in Christ Jesus, there is now no condemnation. And he says this in verse number eight, verse number eight, verse, I mean, chapter eight of Romans, Romans eight, verse number one, he says there is now no condemnation. And he says it right after he concludes chapter seven. And chapter seven is a familiar passage to most of you, where Paul says, I wrestle. <laughs> There's a war going on. Paul says, every time I want to do good, <laughs> evil is present with me. Every time I want to smile, I frown. Every time I want to speak blessings, I curse. Every time I want to do what is right, evil is present with me. And because evil is present with me, in my mind, in my heart, there is a law to teach me what is right, to show me the right path. Paul says in Romans 7, he says that every time I look up, there's another law coming unto me, the law in my members, my sin nature that leads me to do what's wrong. He says in Romans 7, verse number 24, O wretched man that I am. The word wretched mean O beaten up, O burdened man that I am. Who shall deliver me? Paul is at a point in his Christian life where he's about to give up. Let me speak to somebody tonight and tell you, don't give up on Christ. Don't give up on your Christian life. Don't give up walking with the Lord. For Paul gets to this point in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who is going to deliver me? How can I be delivered? Thank God that he moved from verse 24 to verse 25, where he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. Jesus will deliver me from this sinful death that I'm in. Let me tell you, you don't have to live in sin. You don't have to reside in sin. You don't have to stay in sin. Jesus has died for you. And Jesus is the one who will and can, who have delivered you. That's what we pick up right here today. Paul parallels Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8, where he opens up to verse number 1 in chapter 8. He says, therefore, now there is no condemnation to those who live in the Spirit, those who walk in Jesus Christ. There is now no condemnation. So he comes and he says here in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13, 14, and 15, that the handwriting is being removed. The old writing of the Old Testament is being removed. He says that now he has disarmed the principalities. You see, nothing at all, nothing at all could save us other than Christ. Buddha couldn't do it. Confucius couldn't do it. Muhammad couldn't do it. The only saving power that we have is through Jesus the Christ. He says he has disarmed us in verse number 15, Colossians chapter 2. He says we, he has disarmed all principalities. He has disarmed. He has beaten. He has defeated it. He has given us victory. Jesus Christ has given us the victory because he gave the victory to us when he died on Calvary and we received him as the son of God. And we received him. So much so until he has disarmed the principalities. He has disarmed the authorities. 
he has triumphant leave won the victory over death, hell, and the grave. The Bible says he nailed it to the cross. Mm -hmm. He nailed it to the cross. Made a public spectacle. That's what brings us to verse number 16. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 16. He says, so let no one judge you. I am reading New King James. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which is, which are rather, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Look at these verses. He tells us of what Christ has done on Calvary. He tells us that Jesus has nailed all those things that could defeat us in our Christian walk. Jesus has nailed it to the cross. He tells us that we have not been defeated, but our enemy, the devil himself, has been defeated. Let me tell you, there's a war going on. And the war is not a flesh and blood war seen in Ephesians chapter 6. Paul says the war that's going on around us is not with flesh and blood. It is a spiritual happening in high places. It is a spiritual happening in places that we can't see. It's in a spiritual realm. There's a war going on all around us and this war is tearing us asunder. Racism, spiritual happening. Discrimination is a spiritual fight. Leadership that can't lead and cannot lead. If he could lead, he wouldn't lead. It's a spiritual happening. So we have to understand that we need to be praying. We need to be asking the Lord to change our conditions. COVID-19, if it's going to be fixed, it's a spiritual happening. Mm -hmm. It has to take place through God's anointing and God himself. Mm -hmm. He says that Jesus has been triumphing. He has triumphed over all of these things. He has given us the victory. Not only are we serving a triumphant Christ, we are triumphant people. Right. That's why Paul says to us that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are more than conquer conquerors. We are not just conquerors, but we are also coming to conquer. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. We have no reason in the world to hold our heads down as we walk this Christian walk. Mm -hmm. There is no reason for us to shake at the devil because Jesus has already won the victory. You see, some of us are afraid of things that Jesus has already given us the victory over. He says that, that Jesus has, has nailed it to the cross and he has triumphed over us. And then he says, verse number 16, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 16, he says, because Jesus has given us the victory, so let no one judge you. Let no one judge you. This word judge in the original Greek is condemn. This word judge means to sentence you, to sentence you. This word judge means to avenge you. This word judge means to discredit you. The devil is looking to avenge us, to sentence us, to condemn us, to discredit us, to, and King James says, don't let anybody beguile you. This word beguile means to be disqualified. It means to be disqualified, to be called out. The, this word judge is twofold. Number one, it is a court case. It is a courtroom word. The only person who can, who can give you the final sentence is the judge himself. And also, it is an athletic term. It is an athletic term because it means to be disqualified. 
there are several things you can do on the baseball diamond. There are several things you can, you can do when you're running in a race on the track that could get you disqualified. There are several things you can do on the basketball court that could get you disqualified. And now we know there are several things you can do on the football field that can get you disqualified. So this word judge means that you are disqualified. It means that, that you ought not let anybody disqualify you, condemn you, sentence you, avenge you, discredit you, or beguile you because Jesus has already paid the price. Right. He has paid the price. His, the nails in his wrist, the nails in his hand, the nails in his feet, mm -hmm. the cross he was nailed to, his death on Calvary qualified us. Mm -hmm. And don't let folks, Paul says, don't let people disqualify you. Don't let them judge you. Don't let them sentence you. And the reason why Paul had to say this to the, the church at Colossae is because false prophets were running rampant. It's no different today. <laughs> false prophets are running rampant and he these prophets are beguiling people. They are fooling people. They are discrediting people. They are disqualifying people. False prophets are having their way. Paul says, beware of the false prophets. He says here, the false prophets will come. And the reason why he was writing, because in the Jewish congregations, false prophets had arisen. And when they rose up, they wanted to teach the things that they considered would qualify you to be saved and they consider to qualify you to be sanctified. Are you with me? In other words, in other words, they had festivals. They had festivals going on and, and Paul had to raise up against the false prophets to let them know and to let the people know that these festivals of old does not sanctify you and certainly do not qualify you for salvation. Mm -hmm. The first thing he points out is the Sabbath. What you have to understand that the Sabbath is the only one of the Ten Commandments that are not that is not repeated in the New Testament. I just heard somebody then. The Sabbath, when you talk about the Ten Commandments, and you read all 10 of them. Thou shall not put any other God before me. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Thou should not kill. Thou should not steal. Thou should not covet another man's wife and another man's property, another man's cows and oxen. Out of all 10 of them, the Sabbath is the only one that is not carried over into the New Testament. What I'm saying to you today, you still ought not kill. <laughs> Even in the 21st century, you should not kill, you should not steal, you should not cover another man's possessions, you, you, you should not lie, you should not have any God before him. He is the God and he is the only God. He is the almighty God. You shall not have no other God before him. But he says in the New Testament, Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for the man, and the man wasn't made for the Sabbath. He says a lot there. He says the Sabbath was made for the man, and the man was not made for the Sabbath. Simply because the early church believers believed that the Sabbath, you ought not, on the Sabbath, you shouldn't do anything. Well, all of us will be going to hell around here. Now, I need to remind you the Sabbath is the Saturday. It's Saturday. We don't keep the Sabbath today because since Jesus has died on Friday, resurrected on Sunday, and appeared on Sunday, we celebrate today this great getting up morning. We celebrate Jesus Christ getting up early on the third day morning. 
died on Friday, stayed in the grave Friday night, stayed in the grave Saturday, stayed in the grave Saturday night, rose early that third day morning. Now we celebrate the great getting up morning of Jesus Christ. We don't celebrate the Sabbath. We celebrate the resurrection of our Lord early that Sunday morning. The Bible teaches that he got up early on Sunday morning. He got up so early until there was dew yet on the ground. The preacher back in Mississippi would say he got up so early until the dew was yet on the ground. He got up so early until Pilate didn't get a chance to change out the guards. He got up so early until before Peter and John got into a foot race and found themselves standing before the tomb, he had already risen. He got up so early until Mary and the other Mary didn't get a chance, nor Martha get a chance to anoint his body. Jesus Christ got up early from the, from the dead. My question to you today, if Jesus can get up early from the dead, why you can't get up early Sunday morning from the bed? If Jesus can get up early from the dead, we still walk in church late on Sunday. And even since we've been online, even since you have to, you don't even have to get up and do anything and get pretty or anything. You can walk to the computer or your tablet or your iPad right now. You can get up early and walk to your iPad. And some people still can't make it on time in their pajamas. But Jesus got up from the dead early. But we can't get up from the bed early. So Paul says, Paul says, don't let anyone, so let no one judge you in your food or in your drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or the Sabbath. So don't let people judge you based on these things because these things God is not worried about. Remember now, Paul is defending the Christian walk against these things. He's defending the Christian walk against the Sabbath, against the laws or the ceremonies that they were used to. He's defending the Christian walk over all of these things that they have become accustomed to. He says, these things that are ceremonial, these things that you consider moral, these things of the law. Let me just share with you, Paul says, whatever you do, don't be judged. Don't be condemned. Don't be sentenced or avenged. Don't be discredited or disqualified. Don't be beguiled in your food. Don't be fooled or judged in your drink or regarding festivals or new moons or Sabbath. What he's saying to us today is those things are things that are tradition. They were very legalistic. They were, they were very much checking the box. And, and if, if this is, is good, when this is good, we just check the box. I believe some people today are just checking the boxes. Some people are attending church services just to say they showed up at church. Let me tell you, the church needs to show up in you. We have to get past the point where we're just here to check the box. I attended church today, good. I read a Bible verse today, good. I prayed over my food today, good. I paid my tithes today, good. Stop concerning yourselves with checking the boxes. That's what Paul is saying to them. They just want to check the box. And then when they check the box, they consider themselves greater than others. I, I believe today that there are some people considering themselves greater than others because they check the boxes. Paul says, when it comes to food and drink, don't let anybody look down on you. Don't let anybody... 
as the young folk would say today, make you feel some kind of way. Don't, don't let people make you feel some kind of way because you're not in tune with the foods they eat. Now, let me just stop and let you know, the doctor, medicals, and scientists would tell you don't eat certain food because it makes your body do crazy things. When your body do, do crazy things, then you ought not eat the food. When your body gives you medical issues, then you ought not eat the food. Like right now, I'm thinking right now, as soon as I get offline, I'm thinking about how I'm going to eat this drumstick from the side or from the top. And you can't judge me. You can't qualify me or disqualify me or discredit me. What he's saying is don't get so tied up into what you're going to eat. And if you do get to a point where you can't eat certain foods because of medical reasons, don't eat them because of medical reasons, but don't consider food and drink because of your spiritual reasons. In other words, don't consider the food and drink something that disqualifies you spiritually. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus has to paint a picture before us that he is what matters. He is the one with substance. God had to deal with Peter. Peter. Peter was in a trance. When you look at the book of Acts, you find out that Peter fell into a trance. He had a dream. And he, a great sheep was let down from heaven. And on this great sheep was all kind of animals. And Peter in his dream, as well as, well as in real life, he would pick and choose what not to eat. He would pick and choose what to eat. He would say, I don't eat that. I don't eat that. I don't eat that. I don't drink this. I don't drink this. I don't drink this. And he would do it based on his religion. God had to deal with Peter. And when God dealt with Peter in the midst of this dream, in the midst of this trance, he said to him, Peter, do not refuse to eat anything that I have made. He says, Peter, everything I've made is good. He says, Peter, rise, slay, and eat. That's where you get that statement. Rise, Peter, slay, and eat. We need to understand when it comes to a ceremonial operation, God said, don't determine how holy you are based on your ceremonies. God says he's sick and tired of your ceremonies. He's sick and tired of it. He's sick and tired of your traditions. He's sick and tired of it. I mean, one particular group of people who were great missionaries, they would wear, they would wear red in the fall. They would wear white in the spring. And they would wear yellow in the summer. And they got so caught up on, she doesn't have a red dress on this Sunday. She doesn't have a white dress on this Sunday. She doesn't have a yellow dress on until the whole mission team collapsed. And the mission team collapsed because they got into their traditions rather than getting into God. He says here, don't get stuck in your traditions until you forget about what really matters. What really matters is God. So a whole missionary team, a whole missionary circle, a whole missionary ministry was totally destroyed because somebody didn't have on red on the red day, yellow on the yellow day, and white on the white day. Paul says here in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 16, don't get caught up in what you're going to eat. Don't get caught up in what you're going to drink. Don't get caught up in your religious ceremonies. And then he deals with festivals and new moons because they had a festival for everything. When you go to Hawaii and they give you a tour, they got a God for everything. In Hawaii, they got a God of the grass. They got a God of the water. They got a God of the mountains. It's called polytheism. 
where there are many gods. I stopped by on my way to the rapture to let you know there is only one true and living God. He is God the Father, Jehovah God himself. He is the Yahweh God. He is the God who is the self-existing God. He is Anani God. That's the only true living God. That's why, that's why when Moses was going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, he wanted to know from God, who do I tell Pharaoh sent me? He said, tell him I am. God can be whoever God wants to be at any given moment. That's why the old preacher back home would preach. And when he got to the end of his message, he would always tell the people that, that Jesus, he is the white rose of Sharon. Jesus, he's my battle act. Jesus, he's my bridge over troubled water. It's because God is God and nobody else can be God other than God. He is all I need. Jesus, he, he, is, he is my leaning pulse. Jesus, he's food when I'm hungry. Jesus, he's water when I'm thirsty. It's all in Jesus. In verse number 16, it says, don't get caught up on the festivals. Don't get caught up serving the new moons and, and don't get caught up on the Sabbath. Let me just stop right here and talk about the moons. Too many people are concerned about whether the moon is a half moon, a quarter moon, or a full moon. And they live their lives based on the position of the moon and the shape of the moon and the fullness or the lack of fullness of the moon. They were having festivals for all this. When you worship, your, when you determine your life based on your zodiac sign, Paul said, don't do that. <laughs> don't determine your life, your daily activities on your horoscope. Paul says, don't do that. Don't determine who you're going to date based on whether they are a Capricorn, a Leo, or Aries, or Pisces. Paul says, don't do it. Jesus says, don't get stuck up on your little, your little traditions. I know you used to listen to the song because I did too. And it, it was good. It was a good song when you wanted to get close to your buddy. And I ain't talking about him. I'm talking about her. It was a nice song. It was a nice song when you wanted to get close to your girl. Float, float on. My name is Larry, and I love everything and everybody. Hello, I'm a, I'm a Pisces. I'm a Capricorn. Let me just share with you, the, the Bible teaches, do not get caught up in monthly prognosticating. Monthly prognosticating is when you judge and you predict things based on the moon, the sun, based on the horoscope, based on the zodiac sign. Don't get caught up in it. He says, don't, don't get caught up in it. God, Jesus has come to do away with this. He goes on to say, don't get caught up in the Sabbath. I told you that, that Jesus rose from the dead. Now we celebrate who Jesus is. Early on Sunday morning. Why we have church on Sunday? We have church on Sunday because it represents that great getting up morning. For Jesus cracked, cra he cracked out of, he, he cracked open the tomb. The stone was rolled away. He walked out of the tomb. And when he walked out the tomb, the Bible teaches that he took his head rag and folded right neatly and laid it down on the side. And when you go to a restaurant, if you don't know, the waiter knows or the waitress knows. If you get up to go to the restroom and you take your napkin or your, your towel and you fold it very neatly, and lay it to the side of your plate. The waiter won't even ask you if the person is gone, if the person is through, they know you're coming back. That's right. But if you take your napkin and you ball your napkin up and throw it in the middle of your plate or throw it on the side of your plate, the waiter won't ask the people you're eating to anything. He or she is gonna come by and pick up your plate, 
Put all of your utensils in there and walk off with it without a thing said. Simply because there's an indicator. If you fold your napkin up neatly, sit it on the right hand of your plate or and, and leave it there and you walk to the restroom and come back, it'll be there when you get back if you have a trained waiter. So, so Jesus, when he got out of the grave, he took his head wrap off, folded up neatly, laid it in the grave, and walked out of there. He was sending an indication to us. Those of us who are Christ and those of us who are Christian, those of us who, who have a relationship with the Lord, Jesus is saying, I'm getting out of here on a cloud, but I'm coming back again. Jesus is saying he's coming back again. Jesus has folded his napkin, walked out of the grave, folded and left it there. He's saying, when I leave here on a cloud, I'm coming back on a cloud. Jesus is coming back again. He says, don't get caught up in this stuff. Finally, verse number 17. He talks about the festivals, the new moons, the Sabbath. He said, don't let people judge you based on these things. And then he says, which are a shadow of things to come. The word shadow means the darkness of an era. It means a shade. The word shadow in the Greek means an image. It is a silhouette. It is an outline cast by an object. When you look behind me right now, because the lights are on in this room, you can see shadows protruding from these flowers. And if I take the lights and I move them in closer, then the shadow will move based on where the light is. You see, a shadow is an indication of the real thing. A shadow is an indication of the real thing. I grew up, I grew up watching dog shadows. You see, there was no, no real, real danger in the darkness, but because it kept, there was a shadow cast. People will run from the shadow. Let me just share with you. There's no reason to run from the shadow. There's no reason to run to the shadow because the shadow is just an image. It's just a silhouette of things that is to come, things that are to come. Th these shadows are, are things that are pictures or, or silhouettes or an outline of things that are to come. When Moses put together the tabernacle. God told him how to build it. In Exodus chapter 25, he talks about make, put some red in there, put some purple in there, put gold in there, put, put, make sure you, you, you put some, some, uh, some gold devices in there. He says, make sure you put some white in there. Make sure you put blue in there. These five colors are, are pictures of what Jesus Christ represents. Look at what it says in verse 17. It closes out verse 17, Colossians chapter two. It closes out verse 17 by saying, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So when Moses developed this tabernacle, he put the tabernacle together, just like God said, put it together, but it was a tabernacle that was temporary. It was a temporary tabernacle, and this tabernacle was what God showed Moses, but it was really of something better to come. The Ark of the Covenant brought in the presence of God. Wherever God went, there was the presence of God. Wherever the tabernacle was, wherever the Ark of the Covenant was, people got blessed. Whenever the Ark of the Covenant moved, people were tremendously blessed. They stopped at Obed Eden's house with the Ark of the Covenant. 
And when the ark stopped there, Obed Eden household was getting blessed. I mean, he, you talking about being blessed in the country, blessed in the field, blessed in the city, blessed going out and blessed coming in. Obed Eden's household was being blessed because the ark of the covenant was there. And the reason why he was so blessed is because the ark of the covenant represented God's presence. It represented God's power. And it represented God's peace. So as long as the Ark of the Covenant was at Obed Eden's house, Obed Eden's house in his community was being blessed. But when David said, let's go down here and get this Ark of the Covenant. And when the Ark of the Covenant came on into Jerusalem, David began to dance and celebrate because God's presence was there. Mm -hmm. But let me just tell you, the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant was just a shadow. <laughs> of things that was just to come. It's in the text. Verse 17 says, the substance was not in the shadow. The substance, even though God was using it temporarily to bless people, the substance was not in the ark. The substance was not in, the substance was not in the tabernacle. The substance was in Jesus Christ. You see what the Old Testament does, it paints a picture of Jesus coming. Where the New Testament placed Jesus in the presence. The Holy Spirit is present with us today. Because it was just a shadow. Those things were just a shadow of what is yet to come. The substance is in Christ. I want to tell somebody today, regardless of how close you are to your parents, the substance is in Jesus Christ. This word substance means the body. The word substance means the slave. And let me just share with you. If you're not a slave of Christ, you're a slave of the devil. It says the substance. The substance is of Christ. The power is of Christ. The influence ought to be in Christ. If you're influenced by anything or anybody, it ought to be Christ. Christ Jesus. Whenever, whenever I counsel with a couple, I just want to know one thing. The first thing, then I can ask all the other questions. And that one thing can settle the rest of the questions. Number one, does the person you're about to marry love the Lord? Number two, does the person you're about to marry love the Lord more than they love you? <laughs> than he or she loves you? Because if he or she loves the Lord more than they love you, he or she loves you, then you're going to have a great marriage. If they love the Lord more than, and they give the Lord more time than they give you. Brothers, I just set some of y'all free. If she doesn't love the Lord more than she loves you, she's not going to really love you. Because her love has to be in Jesus Christ. Her love has to be founded, seated, rooted, and grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sisters, I just set you free. Don't go looking for him. Just admire him from a distance and find out where his first love is. If he loves Christ first, he is no problem with loving you. If he produces for Christ, he has no problem with producing for you. If you got a man or a woman that loves you so much that they're going to buy you anything, give you everything, you, you don't judge it based on that. Judge it based on what they give to the Lord. If you got a boyfriend, you got a girlfriend, and she doesn't tithe, your budget ain't going to set right. Ooh, good God Almighty. If you have a, a, a person who you're walking with, who you're spending your time with, and they stealing from the Lord, they're going to steal from you. Malachi says it like this. Will a man rob God? Yes, he will in tithes and offering. Yes, he has in tithes and offering. And let me tell you, we sit next to people Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. We listen to people Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. We spend our time with people Sunday after Sunday after Sunday who will not give 10% to the Lord. Therefore, they're robbing the Lord and they certainly will rob you. Right. Woo, good God of mine. <laughs> and if they rob the Lord, you don't think they're going to rob you? 
You got to make sure. You got to make sure that they love the Lord more than they love you. Because Paul says the substance, the, the substance, the body, the substance, who they're a slave to, the substance is of Christ. You got to find you a friend that loves the Lord more than they love you. You got to find you a mate that loves the Lord more than they love you. You got to find somebody who spend quality time in the word of God or let them find you. Someone who spend quality time in the word of God unpacking the word. Somebody that spent quality time in the word of God, walking through the word and doing the word. Because if you're dating someone or you're spending your quality time with someone who does not put God first, let me just share with you, they're going to put you first for a moment. Mm -hmm. But if they put God first, they have no problem with putting you first. The text declares, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, declares that the substance is in Christ Jesus. There may be somebody listening to me tonight, and they've been wondering why the joker wouldn't act right. If he or she does not put their confidence in Jesus Christ before they put their confidence in you, then you got a sorry person on your hand that's going to give you what you want for a moment, and then it's going to fizzle off. But if they love the Lord more than they love you, you got yourself something. Somebody ought to get off this broadcast tonight and go run and ask your friend, your husband, your your boyfriend, your girlfriend, ask them how much they love the Lord. Then ask them how much do they love you. If they love you more than they love the Lord, their substance is not in Jesus Christ. And it's going to come to a screeching halt. It's going to come to an awful end if they don't love the Lord more than they love you. You need a friend. You need a partner. You need a you need a dog, you need you need a girl, you need a boy, you need somebody to hang out with you that loves the Lord more than they love you. The text declares the substance is in Christ and in Christ alone. There may be somebody listening to me tonight that needs to get to know Jesus. I submit to you Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm not talking about growing up in church. I'm not talking about being baptized. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus the Christ. You need a relationship. You need a right relationship with Jesus the Christ. You can have that relationship tonight. All you got to do is invite him in. And if you would, just bow your head with me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Will you join me in prayer and just repeat after me? And ask Jesus to come on in. Let us pray. Father God in heaven. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. And make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed that prayer you are now born again. You've trusted Jesus to be your Lord. To be your Savior. And there are some of you who have prayed this prayer and invited Jesus Christ into your life before, but for some reason or the other, you have not totally committed to him. You need to rededicate, reconfirm, renew your relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to strengthen your fellowship. I say to you tonight, get involved with Christ. Read your word, attend your church services, walk with God and let God influence you more than anything else influences you. And if you're listening to me tonight and you don't have a church home or you're in between church homes, I rep recommend Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, 
Will you trust him? I recommend the New Beginning Church as your church home. Where Jesus Christ is in charge. If you want to join the New Beginning Church, you can do, do so by inboxing me and let me know. And I can send you the form, get you all signed up, and we can rejoice in your joining. In the last 30 days, we've had five people to join by by way of online broadcast. Inbox me and let me know that you want to be a part, a member of the New Beginning Church. And we will rejoice with you and celebrate you. If you've received Christ tonight or you have rededicated, recommitted, or renewed your relationship with Jesus Christ tonight, inbox me and let me know so we can rejoice with you and celebrate with you. We, uh, we enjoyed you tonight and being a part of our service. We enjoyed having you on the airwaves. We enjoyed you walking through Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 with us tonight. Look forward to seeing you next week the same time. Look forward to seeing you Sunday at 9 a.m. and also Sunday at 10.45 a.m. Tonight, it is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. You can do that by three means. First of all, you can give by way of Cash App. You can give by way of Cash App. Our cash tag is dollar sign NBC Soul, hashtag NBC Souls, NBC Souls. You can give through Cash App, uh, dollar sign NBC Souls. The idea here is that the New Beginning Church is looking for souls for Jesus Christ. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea here is that as we lift Jesus, Jesus promised to draw all men unto himself. He promised to draw all men unto him if we lift Jesus. He says, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Or you can send uh, your offering, your tithes to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. We want to make sure that you are, you continue to follow us at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning and also for Sunday school, 9 a.m. on Sunday morning and also 1045 for our worship service on Sunday morning. And you can also join us every Wednesday night right here. You can join us every Wednesday night right here at 7.20 p.m. for our Bible study. Thank you so much for being a part of of our service on tonight. On our prayer list tonight, we're praying for Pastor Jasper Orr and his family. We're praying for Pastor Jasper Orr and his family. We want to lift them before the Lord. We're praying for Sarah Orr and, and her family. We're praying for Sarah Orr and her family as we lift, lift her and them before the Lord. And we're praying also for Jesus Trejo, and the death of their, their father. We're praying for Sister Malo and, and her family. And we're praying specifically for her brother, Jesus Trejo, and the death of their father. He was the caregiver, so we know that many times the caregiver takes it harder than anybody else. We want to lift that family in prayer. We're also praying for the New Mount Calvary Church, and we're praying for the Holman Street Church here in Third Ward, Houston. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here again at the New Beginning Church, where we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Thank you again. God bless you and God keep you. Let us close out in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. 
We honor you, we glorify you, we magnify you, we thank you for being good and being God. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, that you have given us victory, that you made us more than conquerors, that there is now no condemnation for those of us who walk after Christ and not after the devil, for those of us who walk according to the word and the will of God. We thank you, Lord, that we have no reason to be judged. We don't have a reason to feel some kind of way. We don't have a reason, Father God, to get involved in festivals and get involved in the Sabbath or getting involved in new moons. We don't have to be concerned about our eating and drinking when it comes to our salvation experience or our sanctification experience. We thank you that the substance, Lord, is in Jesus, the Christ himself. We come lifting up Pastor Jasper Orr and his family, Terry. We pray that you bless them and heal them. Bless his children, Father God, and keep them. Lord, we thank you for the victory that you've given already. We pray for Sarah Orr, we pray for her and her family, her husband. We ask you, Father God, to bless them in a mighty way. We pray for Jesus Trejo. We ask you to give him strength, give him hope. Relieve him of all discomfort. Comfort him as only you can, Lord. We pray for the Holman Street Church. We pray for the New Mount Calvary Church. We pray for the New Beginning Church. Keep us focused. Keep us in your will. Bless us, Father God, that we will continue to honor you in all we do. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him, the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we see each other again, let us just say together, Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.